Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 74 of the Citrix Session. I'm your host, Andy Whiteside. Uh, I've got Bill and Ben with me as usual. Bill, how's it going? Going fine, Andy. How are you? I'm good. You're you're working out of uh, the Charlotte office today, right? Here in Huntersville, North Carolina. Down here in Charlotte for a week. Now, I'm traveling um, next week and the week after that and the week after that. You're here this week, and we were just chatting with Ben before we got started. Ben, you've been on the road for a couple days, if not a week or so. Is are we getting back to normal? Uh, I think it's 50-50. I think that, you know, people getting vaccinated are getting more comfortable meeting. We still have uh, some reluctance to getting on site. Some of the meetings I've had have been off site in kind of a central location. And, you know, the ones that are vaccinated get, do not wear their mask. And the ones that are not vaccinated do wear their mask. So uh, I think it's half and half, Andy, but a little bit more. And I see a little bit more coming, so some light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Well, let's hope so, because uh, I just got through with a lunch meeting just now when I walked in here. And other than eating way too much, I've had a breakfast meeting and a lunch meeting. I've had two big meals. Um, I, 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 lost some, I, I, I don't wear the mask anymore, but I think I'm going to get super fat in the process. <laughs> so, guys, uh, thanks for joining me. Um, Today we're covering a blog about exploring new features on Citrix Workspace app uh, for Linux. And, and I hesitate or, or highlight the fact that we're talking about Citrix Workspace app uh, because in the world of Citrix, you can get really confused about what Workspace means because it, it's a marketing term that can go all kinds of ways. In this case, we're talking about the Citrix Workspace app, which is basically the Citrix receiver, modern day, modern day version, modern day name for a Citrix receiver uh, for the Linux operating system platform which includes a lot of these thin client vendors. Uh, some are more native than others, uh, but certainly Linux is a, a big player in the virtual app and virtual desktop space. Ben, you were just uh, highlighting the fact that uh, when you were here in my office recently, I gave you a uh, iGel RX420, which is what their ARM-based system, you know, also known as Raspberry Pi, but we really don't call it that. We call it their ARM-based RX420. Uh, have you had a chance to play with that yet? I have not because I've been out on the road, but as I was telling you, because of this article, it's motivated me to get that thing out of the box. And I was going to set that up on a single monitor, but some of the stuff we're going to talk about, I think I'm going to take it a step up and put a multi-monitor on it. Well, I would caution you briefly on that one. This, uh, the iGel RX420 is based on the 32-bit version of Citrix Workspace app. So I don't know that everything is in there. If you really want to if you really want to play with uh, the full-blown version, get, you know, iGel on non-ARM, uh, and you definitely would. But I'd, I'd be curious to see what of this is in that. Hold on, it says, which release? We have increased virtual channel capacity from 32 to 60. Okay, uh, I, I, uh, I, I don't know 100%, Ben, that what you would play with would have all these features because of the timing, for one thing, and also because it's the 32-bit version, for now at least. They're going to change that on the uh, RX420. Um, I've got, I've got, well, I'll be your guinea pig, Andy. Yeah, no, give it a shot. See what happens. Yeah, now I do want to take a step back for a minute before we dive into this. You said something that I have experienced a little bit working with different clientels and just some of the confusion that goes around workspace, workspace app. And it even takes a, a step deeper when you talk about workspace app and running workspaces in HTML5 clients. So I don't want to detract away from the subject, but I think that is an important thing for people to understand is that from a workstation perspective, you can run this in two different modes. You can run this in what I would consider full, full blown fat client, which is the workspace app, which we're going to be talking about today. But you can also run this in a browser client through HTML. Yep. And it's interesting some of the differences between those platforms. So at some point, we need to circle back around one day and kind of clarify all the different versions that workspace comes in, in you know? Well, let's let's do it now because I mean that I I have been around program neighborhood agent program neighborhood Citrix receiver Citrix HTML receiver Citrix receiver app for Google now we're at workspace app for insert operating system here we're at workspace app through HTML five through a browser let's let's try to let's let's put Bill Ben Bill on the spot uh, Bill as far as workspace apps go. Give us the ones that you can think of off the top of your head where there truly is a full-blown Citrix app that gets you into your Citrix plethora of application and desktop options. 
Windows, Linux, Mac, and some thin clients. And I'm sure I'm missing some. Well, so Windows, of course, uh, Windows 10, really, but you, you could have like the Windows X, which is what Windows 10 lightweight is going to be, I guess, called. Uh, mm -hmm. Then, of course, Windows 7, but really Windows 10. Uh, you mentioned, you mentioned um, I, um, excuse me, Linux, and then you mentioned uh, thin client in part of that conversation. So you got... Um, You've got the, the thin client vendors like iGel that puts the native, or in iGel's case, three of the native Citrix workspace apps into one of their layers in their read-only operating system. And then you have like Dellwise, their thin OS, where it's kind of a customized version of Citrix workspace app, which I think that's pretty common across many of the other uh, thin client vendors. Uh, you mentioned Mac, right? Uh, Google Chrome OS. True. Um, what 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 other ones were there? Well, you got your you're just talking you're just talking fat client, man. What about your mobility space with Android, iOS, on the Apple side, and you've got all those versions out there. Yeah. iOS and Android, absolutely. Yeah. And do they all 100% act the same way? No. Does Citrix do a pretty good job of getting them all to act the same way? Uh, I think so. For the most part, yes. Well, so HTML5 is the only one that I would say is kind so of. So, Andy, I, I. Go ahead, Ben. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah. Well, I ran into a situation this morning that, you know, we're, now that we're on the topic and Bill, you were driving towards this is the HTML5 stuff. You know, there was a problem I was having with USB pass through and getting that to work in HTML5. And then I went to the the fat client, you know, the workspace app client, and I got it to work instantly. So now I've got a little bit of a research project and I'll throw this out to you guys. And if any of our listeners have to answer this, please forward it to me because I'm learning as much as everybody else is. All right, you got them accessing with the HTML5. I know there's a plugin out there. Does that plugin act like the workspace client that will give you the full functionality to do USB pass through? Or what are the limitations there? I, I've got questions about that. Well, first question to ask you, Ben, is what is the core operating system that you were doing your test on just now? We were doing it from a Windows box. Okay. You used, uh, Internet Edge Explorer. And so, so Edge Explorer is, Edge is based off a Chromium derivative, right? So that's part of the story. But your your comment was, I think, exactly right. You, you, you do it on Windows first because that always has the first features. Uh, you test it there, see if it works, and then you go over to the HTML five version uh doing it through a browser bill do you know anything more specific about the plugin ben's talking about because i didn't i don't really know that there is a plugin it's just html5 code now isn't it well it's interesting i'm actually looking at the site right now and there does appear to be some downloads associated with the latest version of html5 but to be honest with you i'm not entirely clear at this point on what that what the purpose of that is so Ben, what we're saying is that's that's news to us. I would have told you an hour ago there was no such thing as a plugin, but Bill reiterated what you just said, and apparently there is. I don't know what that does and what it doesn't do at this point. Being Internet Edge browser. Well, there you go. We got it. We got another thing to research for you there, Andy, because I need to find that answer out. Because what my client wants to be able to do is they want to use the HTML5 interface and they want to be able to do USB pass through. And right now that's not working for us. And we know it's no kind of block or anything, because again, when we go to the full blown workspace app, mm -hmm. we get the functionality we want. And so I've heard of this plugin, but you know, there's so many ways that you can uh, design this stuff, implement this stuff. I've got to go back to my well and go, okay, tell me about this plugin. Does it do this functionality? So what my hope is, is that this plugin will initiate, you know, the workspace app from the HTML client so that we can get USB pass through to work in an HTML environment. But again, Another thing we're going to have to research there. So, so Ben, I would like to ask you a question or two, actually, and challenge you on that. Do you, if you've got to add a plugin, doesn't that break the whole model of doing it using the HTML5 to begin with natively? So, Andy, what I don't know and what I want to find out is if you're contained in the HTML5 window and, the, and you don't really see any evidence of the full-blown app being launched, yeah. I could see where this customer might want to disguise it all in an HTML front end, but I, that I don't know. I mean, if it launches a workspace app window and now you're working between an HTML5 client and the workspace app client, 
Yeah, I mean, you got a point there, but again, I, I've got to investigate this. I, I, when I got with the customer this morning, I was like, we just tested everything on Friday. What's the problem? And then she got in and she showed me that she was working from the HTML version. I was like, oh, okay, well, this is different. And so those are some of the things I need to kind of come back and see. So I'll be lobbing this up soon and I'll be ready to report back to you guys. Or again, if some of our listeners have answers to this, please send it to us because we've got questions. We need some answers. Well, and, and Ben, I want to do something real quick. I want to make sure people know that when they when they go to when they have the workspace app installed and they go to a browser, but it actually launches the workspace app, that's not really using the browser. That's using the browser to get there, but then you're launching it through the workspace app. A lot of people confuse that with the HTML5. It's when you actually launch the app or, or desktop resource and it launches within the browser itself and the receiver code is or workspace code is delivered to the browser and the browser renders it. That's when we're really talking about HTML5. Um, I, I'm, I'm often concerned because people will think that just because they got there, started the process through a browser means they're using a browser and that's really not using HTML5. That's just using that to launch the Citrix Workspace app. That's correct. Now, how you can tell the difference is this is, if it's running in true HTML5, like what this customer did this morning is she came in through the browser interface, she hit her desktop and her desktop opened in another tab. Yeah. And then that's when I knew, oh, you're using the HTML version. And it was her desktop running in that uh, Edge tab. So that what started telling me, okay, here's the difference than what we tested the other day. So, so Ben, I have a question, another part two of a question for you. Why are they trying to do it without using the full-blown app? What's their business justification? I'm not saying they're wrong, but why? Why, why use the less capable HTML version instead of the full workspace app version that they launched from a browser? Andy, that's a good question. I don't, I don't have the answer to that question. I'm primarily working with the test and dev guys, and this is what they're telling me they want to do, but I can ask that. Uh, sometimes I take what they want and try to make it happen and not try to justify it, but you do have an interesting point there. Why are they trying to cocoon all this into the HTML5 version? What would be interesting is if they eventually want to take this to like a secure browser and do it in the secure browser. And so there's part of me that thinks that, you know, that might be a possible spin on this, but today I don't have an honest answer for that, Andy. And, and most of the time when I challenge people and ask that question, they don't have a legitimate business reason. They just, they're trying to keep it as lean as possible. They read somewhere you can do it. And then they realize later that printing becomes weirder. Uh, channels like uh, the USB pass-through become weird or not capable uh, a lot of times people do it just because they can, not because it's the real business. There's a real business justification for why they're trying to, 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 you know, just hop over the idea of using the workspace app. Yeah. Well, and to, you know, kind of what led us down this rabbit hole is just the various versions that this can come in. You know, it does get really confusing. And, and you know, we've all been employees of the company and we still kind of step back and go, OK, you know, so again, I thought it was very interesting that with the workspace app that we tested on Friday, all functionality was error. We go to the HTML version, we're limited. And, you know, I don't know if that's to blame or not. I'm kind of doing some educated guessing here, but I think what I'm going to find out when I go back to my support team is you're going to have to have this plugin and then that's going to emulate, you know, that's going to call upon the application that's on the desktop. And then to your point, you know, if it's still behind the HTML window, it's still in the, in the tab, everything's running in the tab and you're, not really aware that the app's being used or it's got an open window, I could see where that would be a business case. You know, to your point, to keep things very lean, not having the employees get out of too many things. But again, we'll have to kind of see how all that, that falls out in the lab. Hey, Ben, I know you're in the car. You, can you see the uh, the feature matrix I pulled just pulled up with has all the different versions on it and what they can do and can't do? I apologize, Andy, I cannot. Uh, I'll send this to you to make sure you have it in your email, but this is, um, not quite all the latest uh, versions, but close. And it is uh, really good about comparing which ones can do what and which ones can't do what. I'll send it to you. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. So I think we've kind of covered the idea that there's a new workspace app for Linux. It's uh, version 2103, which means it came out in March of uh, 2021. Uh, the first paragraph here that gets into the substance is the idea that it's gone from 32 to 64 channels which means Citrix is just getting more prepared for more unique things it can do within the protocol, uh, like Zoom and WebEx and Teams and maybe RingCentral and other VoIP related things. They wanna to try to optimize even further than they already have. 
Uh, Bill, any thoughts on in adding 32 more channels into the solution? No, I think you're right. Uh, you know, it's just giving giving developers and and uh, other organizations the ability to plug into it and start using, you know, start using some of those channels for their own purposes. Uh, the screen pinning is one example that we're going to get to in a minute. And and Ben, this might be a really good time to re bring up the idea that what I talked about a minute ago with the 64 bit versus 32 bit. My guess is things like doubling the amount of channels is things they Citrix won't do in the legacy 32 bit that the RX 420 from iGel is running. Um, so this, this might be an example of something you wouldn't see in the older legacy version that you're going to get on that iGel RX 420. Now, to be clear, every other version of iGel that you would run would have the 64-bit Linux uh, app, so that wouldn't be a problem. Right. Um, ben, any thoughts on the, uh, the additional channels? Well, I think, you know, as things get leaner, as far as an infrastructure perspective, as more subscription services come down, you're going to need the ability to render higher definition video over a smaller pipe. You're going to need more horsepower on the endpoint and a smaller footprint. So I think this is all leading up to, you know, I see the day where the endpoint is a very small cookie cutter box. And what's going to make the difference is what you can do with these channels as far as rendering video, rendering audio, and giving a really high definition experience, you know. Right. So I think the next part is where we start taking advantage of some of that, which is uh, the idea of pinning screens. I, I think on the Windows side for a while, we've been able to kind of create multiple screens within a single screen. I'm, I'm using a stand-up desk. I used to have two big monitors bolted down to the stand-up desk. Uh, I'm now using a single monitor. I've got two monitors behind me hooked up to an iGel unit. Uh, so when I need to sit around, sit down and do real work, uh, but for doing things like this podcast, I'm perfectly fine. But I think what we got here, Ben and Bill, tell me if I'm wrong, is the idea to use the uh, the Linux Citrix viewer bar and be able to actually take one larger, wider format monitor, potentially, and carve it into two or four, potentially, uh, desktops all within a single screen. Is that right, Bill? Yeah, that's right. And they've had this in the Windows app where you could take, and this is really targeted, I think, at these really wide angle or wide monitors, these, you know, 42 inch um, monitors where you can you you get the ability within your within the workspace app to divide them into two or three and you can you can put them you know side by side or top and bottom or any you know mixture thereof uh, and and really use that screen real estate to your advantage it looks like they're bringing this even to a greater degree into the Linux workspace app hey Ben have you had a chance to see anybody doing this concept in production on the Windows side with the workspace app I have not Andy have you had a chance to even do this one yourself? It's not something most people even know about, but when you find it for the first time, if you have a big enough monitor, it's a game changer. Well, I've seen like, you know, to Bill's point, my boss, Jeremy, has one of these nice, big, long 42 inch monitors. And uh, when I first went to work with him, I, I salivated over it a little bit. So, but he's always talked about being able to, you know, present three or four windows in this nice, large monitors. So again, I think it's just where's the market going and they're just they're just laying the groundwork to be there when it comes you know right now bill and andy correct me if i'm wrong these monitors are still fairly on the expensive side there's actually uh one that we bought for one of our employees here uh and i need to go uh i need to go get it back because what happened was when that employee left i gave it to my son to do gaming on that's a different story um but i need to go get it back or i need to go get one like it uh, because Ben, I think that one was in the three hundred dollar range. It was it was within reach of normalcy. Wow, now that would be like I know the I looked at them right when I first started with Citrix, and they were around you know between nine and eleven hundred dollars. And you know I like high technology, but that's a lot of money to spend on a single monitor. Yeah, it, it did come down in price, but you know if you're if you're looking at the really high resolution, low you know high FPS, low. Um, low latency, then yeah, you're going to probably pay that. Yeah. Well, and then there's the psychological thing where like the guy who runs our sales here, he, um, he prefers to have two physical monitors because it, it, it's something logical to him about separating it onto two physical monitors versus, versus taking one, one physical and virtualizing and screen pinning to the various places. You know, Andy, I would have to let him sit down with it for about an hour and see if he had that same opinion. I mean, has he spent any time working on that type of monitor? He has not. Um, 
He is not. It would be. I'd be curious to see whether he could get he could get flipped to this different concept. I don't know. I mean, I've seen. I've had a couple of friends of mine show me theirs, and it literally is like you know you're encased. I mean, it, it is a it is a neat experience, and I have uh, salivated them over a long time. And you guys got me curious. I'm going to be going home and seeing what the latest prices of them are. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's nice, man. It'd be hard to say you could not go to that format because it's lit it literally looks like a double monitor. What I like about it is you got the bevel out of the way. You yeah. don't have that line that goes down the center and you've got options. If you want to be one big monitor, cause you're doing some type of multimedia, you can, if you want to be split monitor, you can. I think Jeremy has his up to like three different splits. So he's getting three different screens. Well, the, the big win for me is the ability to have one base that I can now put on my stand-up desk and it can go up and down with me uh, taking two monitors. I had to literally take uh, C clamps, and bolt them down so that it wouldn't fall off whenever I would try to raise my desk. Oh, it's the little things, isn't it, Andy? Oh yeah, first first world problems. So guys, what else was it uh, in this document where they talked about enhancements to the Linux app? I think Ben was there. Any, ben and Bill, was there anything else that uh, caught your eye in terms of this blog, or is there any other topics that you know about related to the workspace app for Linux that we want to bring up? I think the only other one was the, uh, the the inclusion of the app protection feature in what looks like experimental mode. Um, and that's that, uh, I believe app protection, if my memory serves me, Andy, is that uh, that whole concept of screenshotting and uh, watermarking and, and those type key logging and those types of things. Yeah, I gotta tell you guys a story. We, we moved to app protection here at Zintegra uh, and I was doing a demo the other day on my Windows laptop and I had app protection turned on and I had teams going, a team's meeting. And because Trevor and our team had locked it down, I went to show app protection in use and I couldn't because app protection kicked in and it wouldn't let the people see my demo because the screen sharing piece was in play. That was, it took me a few minutes to say, hey, what's broken? And like, oh, this isn't broken. That's how it's supposed to work. But I think you were demoing it. it was the idea that now that applies to the Linux world too. So if I were to go to do this with this particular version of the Workspace app on one of my iGel units, I'd have a similar type of, of uh, um, negative uh, result, but it would be intentionally negative result. Well, Andy, you didn't realize you were demoing it at the time. I was demoing. So it, 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 I'm sure that at that moment when you realized what was going on, that was pretty impactful to your customer because your customer is going, wow, he's getting caught by his own technology. You used to say it to me a long time ago. You were eating your own dog food, my friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was. I just hope uh, this was a kind of a newer Citrus customer. So I was showing them this very, very advanced feature. Uh, I was really just trying to show them basics between VDI and workspace app, uh, micro apps, and then the app protection kicked in. So it might have actually bit me uh, on the backside in this case, uh, but, had, but if they were seeing it for what it really was, they should have seen that as a positive for sure. So, you know, I've, I've discovered something, and Bill, I'd be interested to hear your comments on this. <clears throat> this is not something that a lot of existing Citrix customers know about, and they're relatively amazed when they hear that we can do this. And this brings a lot of value to organizations because you're now saying to organizations, we can help you with key logging, anti-screen scraping, and, and that's huge. I mean, that's a huge security benefit to have in the product. Yeah, I would agree with you, Ben. I, I don't know that customers really know it that well or understand it. And it, it really comes down to making sure that we get the message out somehow through this or other means. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good, it's a good product. And, you know, it just amazes me when I'm talking to people and I start talking to them about what we can do. They just, they're shocked. They're looking at other products to do that. And I'm like, no, it's, it's, it's baked into our product. Here's how we use it. And here's how it's available to you. So Ben, here's a question for you. You've been a Citrix customer for longer than you've been a Citrix employee. Did you think of Citrix as a security play when you were a Citrix customer? Holistically, yes, Andy, I did. And this is the reason. It, it wasn't because of the cybersecurity things that we face today. It was more the endpoint. Having a very, you know, we were all HP thin clients and not to say that they were hack proof, but, you know, somebody had to come in there with some, some smarts to be able to hack that in. And then just having everything fortified in my own today resource location. Yeah. So from that end, I did see it as security play as, you know, got very low profile endpoints that are, you know, relatively easy to protect and monitor and watch. I've got a very robust back end where I can do things very simply, make changes in a singular space. 
But now that I've become a Citrite and I've been, you know, kind of exposed to the whole portfolio of products we have, we're just building upon that trust. You know, we got the app, app protection that we're talking about here. We're getting into the cybersecurity world with our products, you know, SASE and SIA and all those things. So I do believe we are bound to become a heavy security company. And it's just, it's where the market's moving and where we're moving with the market. Yeah, that's where the money's going. Here, here's this part two of that question. Were you able to convince in your five years of being a Citrus customer that you're, did you were able to convince your management that it was a security play or did they never get it that way? You got it. So there were two pivotal moments in my career at CNSA that proved that Citrus was the right answer. One was when we um, merged with another healthcare facility and we were responsible for rolling out the IT system in that new facility. Uh, she came to the new facility day one and she commented to me that it felt like one of the facilities that we had owned for years. And I told her that was because it was Citrix. We were able to, you know, essentially gut what they had and put our stuff in very easily and migrate what they had in our infrastructure. And it was seamless. Uh, the other one came when the pandemic started and I had received an email that just said, thank you. And I called back on that and I was like, you know, I appreciate the note, but I'm curious as to what happened they were able to send their 500 plus employees to their homes and not miss a beat. The environment was the same as it was in the office. Employees were able to do their job instantly. They had gone to an all Citrix platform before the pandemic. So they had the capacity, the resources, yada, yada to do it. So those were two very pivotal moments. So did they see it as a security play? I think so, because they had all those users coming in from home and they felt like they were able to deliver their resources without any kind of change. And uh, they also saw how flexible and how agile that it made them that they could do things very quickly without having to reinvent the wheel. So the best part of your answer was it was operational efficiencies with security in play without them even knowing it. Exactly. Yeah, that, that's the best type of security. When, when things are secure and you don't even realize they're secure, they're not getting in your way, uh, but they're still secure. Yeah, it's one thing when a boss, you know, really it, when you're dealing with the sea le sea level, it's usually the boss of your boss yep. walks through the building and she says, I just feel like I'm walking in one of our facilities and I'm able to go. That's because of Citrix. Yep. No, absolutely. That that and your team's work to, to get Citrix in the right position, right? I mean, let's be honest. There's a lot of places where Citrix fails, but it's not because that company received the bad code. It's just they didn't do a good job implementing it the right way. So Andy, that's interesting. And I would love for Bill to comment on this. I go in the companies that they're very strategic with Citrix and they've looked at it as a holistic approach to their environment. And then I've also seen some companies that go, it only fits this purpose and they never think about it doing anything else. Those are two interesting conversations because the people that have embraced it, you want them to go deeper. You want them to look at app protection. You want them to look at our security portfolio. But the ones where it's just a little niche, those are hard conversations and you've really got to go in and open their eyes of, you know, we're a platform. You know, we save workspace. But what I've really started saying to people, if you're looking at the holistic portfolio of our products, it's a workspace platform and you have to pick where you fit inside of that platform. It's not just about virtual apps and desktops anymore. It could be secure browsers. So Ben, the way I look at that, and I'll let Bill jump in too and answer, but I, I want to tell you this. Um, if I go into a customer and they get the big picture story around workspace and micro apps and micro apps with intelligence and the security plays, that's, that's awesome. And that doesn't happen all that often. But if I go into a customer who has one application published virtually to the majority of their users, 80% or more, I consider that a win too. And I don't try to, um, I don't push too hard to try to get them to see the bigger picture because to them it's still a strategic win and i've got a happy citrus customer bill would you kind of what's your thoughts on that yeah i would agree with that with what you just said andy i mean i mean a lot of customers may not see it that way um and they see it as that strategic but they see it as that strategic play for that one business critical app but our challenge is trying to get them to see it beyond that um and i think part of that ben comes with the concept of the workspace platform as you put it uh, historically, you know, some of those customers that are using, using, you know, Zen app, if you want to call it that, or, or hosted, shared, published apps, 
um, historically that they see it that way, but they may not have ever really considered the concept of the workspace. And I think for some customers, if we introduce them to that as part of, you know, some of the expansion of their existing environment, we might be able to might be able to uncover some uh, some opportunity there uh, in terms of being able to expose them to that capability and the benefit that it could provide beyond just that single app. So but one I of the, agree with Andy, getting one that one, single app running is a win. There's no question about it. One, one other point for the for the customer's perspective, it's a pendulum that keeps going back and forth. You know, we had a lot of successful people on published apps, and then we convinced them to go VDI. And now they're now they're extremely satisfied on VDI. And now we're now we're trying to convince them to go back to applications where we can bring in SaaS app and published apps and uh, secure browser based apps and secure browser local mode apps. And so part of it's uh, you know us chasing our tail only to turn around and chase it the opposite direction and then expecting them to turn around right you know with us just as quickly. Yeah, Andy, let's think about this for a minute because you and I had a conversation about five years ago when I asked you, is it time to divorce ourselves from the desktop? Yep. And at that time you told me no, because it would be a divorce. It would be a psychological divorce. People were not used to working without a desktop. Yep. Today's that is, is very different. And I'll give you a reason why. S smartphones and tablets, we've gotten to be more of a mobile society now, and we're working more on mobility. Well, that's done that divorce for us. So I, I was with a customer last week that they want to get rid of the desktop. They want to go to something like a workspace app. They're looking for what they call an employee portal. Let us deliver to the employee what they need. Nothing more, nothing less. If it's not in their portal, they don't need it. And I had to catch myself a couple of times going, well, in the desktop, we could do this. And the guy would look at me and go, I'm not rolling out desktops. I'm rolling out a portal. And yeah. so I think as a society, we're ready to kind of embrace that. And once yeah. we embrace that, that's where the, where the real fun begins. Because then you can start talking to people about, it doesn't matter about the device. Come to the environment. Everything you need is going to be there. And it's going to look the same regardless of where you're at, the device you're on, and really what work you're doing. We should be able to do anything from wherever you're at. So, Ben, if you did a blind test and you put them on a, you put them on a PC form factor, I bet they would gravitate towards the desktop. And then if you had them log into that same environment on a mobile form factor, I bet they would gravitate towards apps. And I bet they wouldn't even know they were doing it. Well, see, Andy, this is where we were talking before I left CNSA about going to flat screen TVs in the, uh, in the exam rooms and going to little eye gel boxes. Yep. I think that's the experience you're going to get. And once you do that, I think people are going to embrace that. You're not going to be sitting down in a machine. You might be remote controlling the machine from a pad. You're now simply displaying onto a, onto a flat screen. And I think that's where you're going to see work go is it's going to become more self-contained and people are not going to have these big elaborate workstations that we do today except for your gamers and people like that yeah well the good thing about the citrix story is you can let people come to their own conclusions and their own use cases it's not unusual for us to have a customer in an industry two customers in an industry one of them does it one way and swears by it and the other one does it the other way and swears by it and you know what at the end of the day going back to my previous statement if 80 percent or more of their users use a Citrix type technology strategically all day, every day, I'm not going to argue with them. I'm going to, I'm going to let them, I'm going to, I'm going to educate them like we're doing here and then let them come to their own conclusions about what's the right use case for their organization. Well, we've, we've always said this, you know, I'm, I'm in a, a situation right now where networking is killing me. Uh, it's not a Citrix problem. It's something in the networking, but of course it's presenting itself in a Citrix session. Yep. And uh, what I worry is that the customer will, go to another solution, but what they will find is that they'll have a similar experience in that other solution because the problem is somewhere in the networking of the solution. And that's where it gets really tough. And uh, I just look at some of our networking engineers and go, we've got to prove this. I mean, we've got to come up with, you know, data that shows them that this is the problem. Yep. Hey, Ben, do you drive a, do you drive a decent car? I drive a Toyota Highlander, my friend. And how does it do on I-77 when traffic's completely stopped? It just sits still jammed up. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't help. You could have the best car on the planet. And if the roads are bad, the roads are bad, whether they're jammed up or, or broken or, or slowed down or what have you. Yeah, without the network, that, uh, those, those bits and bytes that normally would go across that little cable to the monitor now has to go across the network and, and we're all in trouble. But I mean, Citrix has done an amazing job of 
helping it be efficient and resilient. Um, but if it's uh, if it's not if if it disappears on us, disconnects on us, what have you, yeah, we're in trouble. Now, on that note, uh, networking across all of our industries has gotten infinitely better than it was even two and three years ago. Yeah. Um, that, that's been a huge enable. I tell people all the time, the number one thing that's helping a technology like Citrix move forward is actually better networking uh, in addition to all the work that Citrix and others are doing. Higher speeds, lower latency. Yeah. Well, guys, I, th I think we've reached the end of this particular topic. I appreciate you guys joining. It's always fun just to kind of chat and banter to, through some of this stuff, right? And, and that's the thing I would tell you about, you know, being a Citrix partner is we're not always going to agree on every single item. Um, but, you know, the good, good, lively debate on what's what in this space is one of the reasons why we do do this podcast. Ben, anything else uh, on your side before we let you go? Uh-oh. I mean, I fully admitted that I have questions about the company, you know, that I work for. And it's just the technology is so vast that things come up and I go, I don't have the answer to that. So that's where I look at, at, at this podcast to help. And I invite a user that if they've got an answer to a question that I've asked, please email me. You'll shorten my chain of education. And I'm never going to come to this claiming I have all the answers, but I will use this as a platform to get those answers, either from you or Bill or your team or to our listeners. So if anybody out there has, you know, any answers on the HTML5 and the plugin, if you lick that, please email me and let me know because I would be more than happy to present that back to the group and show that to my customer because that's where I'm at in the curve right now. Well, the, the plan for this podcast is to eventually make it live every week and have people uh, join us in the chat window and the questions and, and be able to provide feedback and ask questions. Uh, I'm, I'm a little scared of that concept, but we will get that done uh, as we evolve with this, uh, with this, this concept. Hey, Bill, anything from you? No, I, you know, just a, a good information, a great, great back and forth conversation today. So no, I don't really have anything else to add. Yeah, look, we all, we know we don't know it all, but uh, getting another option for people to consume what it is we do know and, and what we do talk through. I had somebody respond back to me the other day. I, I don't know if it's this podcast where I said it, but somebody sent me a message and said, hey, thanks for the, the context that we cover in the podcast. It really helps me to understand what the blog was about beyond what the author was writing. Uh, so hopefully people are finding that helpful. And, and I appreciate you guys doing this with me. Uh, with that, I guess we'll wrap it up for this one. Ben, Bill, thanks for joining. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Andy. We'll talk to you later. See you.